social distance Southwest Republican Club. We're here in the Grove City Town Hall in the beautiful downtown Grove City. And I just wanted to mention that this is one of the newest um, Republican clubs around just to get information and education out to the public. Sponsored by my small business. I'm a small business owner of Premier Designs. Jewelry. I'm an independent distributor. And um, so I guess uh, Bob will go ahead and or Joe is going to get started first tonight. I have 10, 15 minutes here. So I titled my presentation, America's Money Czar. And there's Van Gogh, he does best, which is blowing up bubbles there. Um, I called it the Money Czar because I think that's essentially what we're doing. Fractional Reserve Banking Office. There's just not enough time to talk about that. But my basic premise is that with banking, privately created competitive banks, I got no problem with. What I've got a problem with is with a government-created monopoly bank. That opens the door for abuse in our economy. Number two, when it comes to money, I think that money should be backed by something physical. And when money is backed by nothing, when it's just paper backed by nothing, and you can print it at will, that opens the door for abuse. And my basic premise is going to be that a government monopoly bank plus money backed by nothing is what gives us economic instability, skyrocketing debt and government growth, and currency debasement, or what I'm also going to call the inflation tax. Okay, so what is the Fed? Why, why did the Fed, why does the Fed say they exist? If you go to their website, they say, we exist to create stable prices, a stable economy, and low unemployment. How to, take a quick survey. Who thinks they're doing a good job at those, those, their, their mission there? Anybody? Must be a few people. Okay, Bob does. That's good. Okay, so you know that sounds great. I like all those things. Let's take a look at the actual numbers. Stable prices. That's the CPI since the beginning of our country. Do you notice anything? The first hundred years stability. We got the creation of the Federal Reserve here, but what happens here around 1970? What happened? We went completely off the gold standard there. So now you got a monopoly bank plus money backed by nothing. And what did they do? They had the ability to print, nothing restraining them, and that is what you see has happened to prices in our economy since that time. Number two, economic stability. I heard Bob say last presentation that before the Fed, Everything was horrible. People were starving, and women had to, you know, sell their children just to survive. I don't know. Yeah. Who and uh, then the Fed came along. The economy was great. Well, these three economists. This is a paper published this December. Actually looked at the numbers. These economists from the University of Georgia. And I've got the whole paper with me. It's a very long paper with a lot of data using the best data available. And the abstract says, drawing on a wide range of empirical research, we find that the Fed's full history has been characterized by more rather than fewer symptoms of monetary and economic stability. I'm just trying, those are the facts. Okay, these are economists who actually looked at the facts. Okay, well, what does Bubble Boy have to say about when we were on the gold standard before the Fed? Bubble Boy himself, Mr. Bernanke, is quoted. There's the link to the Federal Reserve website, the gold standard appeared to be highly successful from about 1870 to the beginning of World War I. During the so-called classical gold standard period, international trade and capital flows expanded. Okay? So even Ben says, can't deny that during this period of economic history known as the Gilded Age, when we went from agrarian to industrial economy and wealth was growing like crazy, this was the best time of economic growth for our country, we are under this so-called classical gold standard, not a phony gold standard, which we got after Bretton Woods and after World War I. Let's look at some more data. This is from, and you can't, this book, A History of Money and Banking in the United States by Murray Rothbard is the best book I've seen. It'll blow your mind about the history of money and banking in the United States. And what we saw during this age is that capital investment increased tremendously in the 1880s. And here's a quote from the book. 
the massive 500% decade on decade increase has never since been even closely rivaled. It stands in particular contrast to the virtual stagnation witnessed um, in the 1970s. So the point is, we were on this classical gold standard. Money was backed by gold, and we have yet to rival this period of growth and, and stability in our nation's history. Okay, so if the facts show us that the Fed is such a failure, let's hypothesize why is the Fed such a failure? Well, my first premise is going to be that central planning works great in textbooks, okay? In reality, that's a different question. I thought maybe the fall of the Soviet Union would teach us a little bit about central planning, but apparently not everybody learned that lesson. This is an economist, Benjamin Anderson, a great economist, edited many economic journals, and if Bob talks about what he did last time, this, this formula, MV equals PQ, which is quantitative theory of money, um, these are some of quotes from this, this economist. Um, and uh, the basic gist of these quotes is that um, you can't, you don't really have the knowledge to centrally plan the economy, the money supply. One great quote here, an infant intelligence with infinite powers at its disposal could arbitrarily straighten out issues of stability. Human intelligence at its present organized cannot undertake it by conscious public planning. We have no machinery for accomplishing the stability except the machinery of the market. Okay, central planning will not bring stability. The markets will bring stability. And some other quotes here. Um, Under the price system, the mechanism for bringing about balance is to be found not in public planning by social governments, but in price fluctuations in the free market. So the Fed is always trying to manipulate this, this P, the price, where they aggregate all the prices in the economy under this one variable, and they say, oh, this has got to be stable. And velocity of circulation, a meaningless abstract number, which is the non-essential byproduct of a highly heterogeneous lot of activities in that, some of which one way, and some of which work another way, affecting prices. So I'm just going to kind of move on quickly from that, but we could talk a little bit more about that later. Um, I love this. Did anybody see this recently where the head of the New York Fed, they're trying to increase their public relations with people. So they went out in New York. And they're trying to tell, take questions and tell people that things are not as bad. You don't have to be angry. And um, this really captured the mentality of the central planner for me. So the people were saying, why are gas prices going up? Why are food prices going up? We give you all this power to create stable prices in the economy. Health care, education, everything's going up. I'm getting squeezed. Mr. Dudley, former Goldman Sachs chief economist, now head of the New York Fed, we tend to see a revolving door there between Goldman Sachs and the Fed, but that's another story, um, said, well, you got to understand that, see, an iPad got twice as powerful in the same amount of time that the price of food went up. So you put it all together in the P equation, price, and everything's fine. And this prompted the flaws and widespread murmuring from the audience with some people yelling, I can't eat an iPad. Okay? If you're a, an older person on a fixed income, you care that an iPad got twice as expensive? This is the mentality of the central planners. Okay. Why is another reason the Fed is a failure? Central planning, number one. Number two, they create the boom bust cycle in the economy. And the great economist, Frederick Hayek, the champion of capitalism, won the Nobel Prize for explaining this theory of how the Fed creates the boom-bust cycle, okay? And I've tried, I talk 45 minutes on this one thing sometimes, but I'll try to do it in one minute here. The basic idea is that the Fed sets interest rates too low, too much credit is in the economy, it creates <clears throat> bubbles, misallocation of resources, eventually the markets need to correct themselves and they crash, okay? That's the markets trying to correct themselves from the, the, the bubble that the, the, the government Fed created, okay? Um, and uh, another great quote from Hayek here, um, which I think every central planner needs to read. I think this is from The Fatal Conceit. 
The curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. That says it all to me. But if the boom-bust cycle theory is also called the business cycle theory, then what we should see is that if the Fed does nothing after a crash, that resources should then allocate themselves to where they really want to be, and the economy will recover quickly. And we only have one instance after the Fed where they actually did nothing, and that was the Great Depression of 1920, which nobody has ever heard of because, and here's the economist um, Robert A. Gordon, the historical economist, the government policy to moderate the depression, not a recession, depression of 1920 and speed recovery was minimal. The Federal Reserve authorities were largely passive. Despite the absence of stimulative government policy, recovery was not long delayed. In other words, we had a crash as big as the Great Depression. The government and the Fed did nothing, and in 18 months, our economy was back on its feet. Contrast that to the responses in the Great Depression and what we're doing now, which is preventing the missile, which is preventing the resources to allocate to where they want to be after the bubble was created and we just have malaise. Okay, so Fed is such a failure. Why do we even have it? I'm going to hypothesize two reasons, and there's probably more. Number one, the government then um, created the Fed and the Federal Reserve Act and the government benefits from the Federal Reserve's purchase of its debt. <coughs> Number two, the banks and the government benefit from something called the inflation tax. Okay. Bill Gross, the biggest bond investor in America, the head of the largest bond fund, has this to say recently. 70% of the government debt issuances since QE2, which shouldn't be called quantitative easing two, it should be called money printing round two. Okay, let's get it right. Has been purchased by the Fed. Seven, Fed is now buying 70% of all the debt that the government is issuing. And Bill, goes, Bill Gross of the Pinko Bond Fund goes on to say, have you ever seen a Ponzi scheme so brazen? And he even goes on to say that you know, Bernanke, and there, there's Bernie right there, the head of the Ponzi scheme. There's Ben again, doing what he loves to do, blowing up bubbles. Um, and uh, basically, Bill Gross says that the Fed has taken this Ponzi scheme to another level, where um, the Fed has joined the party itself rather than orchestrating the game from on high. Um, it has jumped into the pond with the other swimmers. There is no need, as with Charles Ponzi, to find an ever increasing amount of future gullibles. They will just, the Fed will just write the check themselves now. Okay? Fed, after QE2, became the largest holder of government treasuries. There's the link to the, to the Fed website. Okay? But it's even worse than this. They surpassed China, the Fed and, the China, and uh, China. So the, basically the, the, the solvency of our government now rests in the hands of Helicopter Ben and uh, uh, President Wu. Okay? It makes me feel warm and fuzzy. But, uh, oh, this doesn't even count. 700 billion printed to buy all the, the, the debt of Fannie and Freddie and all the other things going on, too. So this is, this is a very conservative, but the red is the Federal Reserve, then we got China, then we got Japan, um, et cetera. Joe, you have five minutes left. Okay. The inflation tax been used since uh, the, uh, by, by emperors and kings. Uh, for years, um, what they do is they debase the currency. The people who get the currency first spend it before prices go up, so they spend it while it's, it's worth more. As it circulates in the economy down to us, we have to spend it with the prices higher. Sorry, can't talk more about this right now, but those are clip coins. That's how they used to debase currency. Now they just go on a computer, type a few zeros, and you know, all this money is in the economy. They don't even have to get their hands dirty clipping things. And, uh, oh, Skywalker 8 on eBay selling a quarter for $8. Well, that's when they still had silver in them. Your quarter is now worth $8. Debasement, currency debasement. So in conclusion, I got some statistics on how prices are going up faster than real income. I won't go into a lot of detail. It doesn't matter your nominal wage. You can make a million dollars a year. If an apple costs a million dollars, who cares? 
prices are going up faster than incomes. Your real wages are going down with the money printing. And my conclusion, uh, I got the Constitution here, but Mike will probably talk about that. You got five minutes, so. Oh. Um, what, did the <laughs> what did the Constitution say? Um, Bob hates this when, when the Constitution comes up, but uh, okay. it said, uh, Article 1, Section 8, that the, the government was to coin money and regulate the value, and that no state shall make anything but gold and silver in, in Section 10, anything but gold and silver tender for payments. Okay, but Bob will say, uh, well, that could be interpreted as they were allowed to print money. But all they need to do, do is look at the Coinage Act of 1792, a few years later, when they actually fulfilled their constitutional responsibilities and they defined, they coined money, they def regulated the value, said one dollar is 371 grains of silver. That's it. And then they minted it and they made sure that it wasn't debased. How? What was the punishment? Yeah. If you debase the currency. How far have we come? All right, here's my conclusion. The choice is clear, at least for me. On the one hand, we could choose the Communist Manifesto, which calls for a central bank, or we choose the US Constitution. We could choose Woodrow Wilson and its progressive era legislation with the League of Nations and the IRS and the Fed, or maybe Thomas Jefferson. We could choose central planning, or we could choose free markets. We could choose a debt and consumption-based economy, which we've had more recently, as opposed to a savings, capital, and production-based economy under a stable currency. Booms and busts, or economic stability, high nominal wages, or high real wages, and money in the hands of the government, or money in the hands of the people. Those are your choices. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Bob, you're next. Now I get the hard one. Defend the Federal Reserve. Um, and typically I anger a lot of my own friends. Just remember, you know, we agree 80% of the time we're, we're not enemies. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a, a um, my background's in economics. Um, masters of economics, um, and I've been working as a portfolio manager, or some people call me a hedge fund manager, or a, what was it, a vampire guarding a blood bank, okay? Um, but my, I have a professional experience with economics and finance. And a lot of the things that I heard being said just simply don't jive with my, and, you know, what I understand is reality with the free markets. Um, so, so what I do is uh, one of my favorite parables in the Bible is the house built on stone, right? And if we're going to take this, because I'm a conservative, we're all conservatives, but if we're going to take this as one of our main um, agendas, we got to make sure it's going to withstand scrutiny. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a lot of scrutiny to these things that you're being told. And I'm gonna show you how to objectively look at these claims and to test them because Joe just rattled off a lot of things. And we're gonna take a look at them. If you take a look, do they really hold any water when you take a look at the market? And I'm not looking at the central planning. The only central planning I look at is the central planning done by the free markets because a bond rate is a market rate. A price is a market price. The government doesn't go out there and set prices, the market sets them. So I use the market, the free market, as my guide to decide who's right or who's wrong. We've got a lot of theories, but the market will tell you everything you need when, to know. When you talk about economic policy or mon monetary policy, you have to understand this, 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 this formula. Everything is based on MV equals PQ. I don't care what economic economist is out there saying this or that. If it doesn't apply to this, it doesn't apply. When Jim's talking about you know, the central planners, the price is the market price. It's a market basket of goods. You know, you can't live in a world where, okay, I have my price level gets worked in here, or your price level gets worked in here, or so-and-so price level. The markets have to have go with an aggregate number. That's what they do. You know, so we can sit there and argue, well, I have a different inflation rate than you do. So what? To have an aggregate value, you have to go with an aggregate, aggregate value, uh, market value and typically, you just simply look at the bond rates, and the bond rates will tell you what the inflation rate is. The markets figure out what inflation is. You don't need a central planner to do it. So MV equals PQ. M is the money supply. V is the velocity. P is the price level. 
and Q is the real output. You can turn all of our economy into that simple formula. And if people are going to talk about monetary policy, and they don't refer to this, they really don't understand what's going on. Because this is how everything's measured. This is how the whole entire world works. All right? Typically, when you deal with this, you deal with velocity being constant. You know, you, give, you produce a dollar, it gets turned over, let's say, four times in a year. Okay? The other thing is, in the short run, the quantity remains the same. Okay? Okay? So, when people are saying, if you print money, you're going to get inflation, right? that is 100% true if, in fact, you could put an economy in a bottle, fix the velocity, fix the quantity. If you produce more money, you will get higher prices. That's a fact. That's just simply how it works. The problem is, that's a textbook. Okay? That's a theory. This is not how the real world works. In the real world, your velocity changes and your quantity changes. Right? So when these people tell you if you print money, you're going to get inflation, they're right with everything else held equal in these theories. Okay? So what Ben Bernanke does is he's not some evil genius there trying to rip people off and produce inflation. What he's doing is he's going to sit there and you want to have stable prices. So you have, to, in order to have stable prices, given the fact that you have a constant velocity, you want to have the money supply grow at the same rate of your economy. If that happens, that's utopia. Because you get stable growth, stable prices. And yes, you're printing money to get that accomplished. Okay? That's how it all works. Okay. Now, um, Here's a picture of ben, uh, Barack Obama riding a bicycle. And you're going, why in the world do you have a picture of Barack Obama riding a bicycle? What I want you to think about is the analogy of when you're riding a bicycle, right, and that gear jumps. So you're in the 20th gear, and it jumps down to the 10th gear. What happens? You've got two choices, right? You can either slow down dramatically, right, if you keep pedaling the same speed, or you can start pedaling like mad to pick up the speed Right? But you won't go any faster, you'll just maintain what you're doing, right? So remember that analogy of jumping gears, all right? And remember that formula, MV equals PQ, okay? Well, here's velocity, right? Velocity took a jump down. The money supply was greatly cut. Um, the, the, the amount of time the money was being spent was greatly cut, right? So your velocity in that formula, MV equals PQ, jumped a gear, it dropped down, right? So, you have your velocity dropping, okay? If your velocity dropping and the Fed doesn't do anything, your price is gonna fall and your quantity is gonna fall. That's a recession, right? That's only velocity though. Remember there's also a money multiplier. We're a fractional reserve system. The money multiplier was cut in half. Not only did your front gear jump, your rear gear jumped as well. So now you're in real trouble. You went from 20 to first gear overnight. Okay? So now your money multiplier is cutting. So what happened now? Now your money supply is dropping like a rock. Your velocity is dropping like a rock. Your price will start dropping like a rock. And your quantity will start dropping like a rock. That is the Great Depression. Okay? That's how we got a Great Depression. Now, if you're Ben Bernanke, what are you going to do? You've got one option. You can print money. So how are you going to get yourself out of a Great Depression? You're going to print money like mad. And how many times have you heard people say, the Federal Reserve caused the Great Depression? How many people have heard that? Yeah. Right? The Federal Reserve caused the Great Depression. Everybody's heard that. Did they ever tell you what the Fed did to cause that Great Depression? No. You want to know what they did? Nothing. They didn't print money. That's the problem. You did, it was an inaction. It's kind of like an ER doc walking by somebody with having a heart attack, not realizing they had a heart attack. They didn't print money. They let the banking system collapse. That's the problem. So the inaction of the Fed caused the Great Depression. However, without a Fed, you still would have had the same results because nothing would have been done. Today, when we have this big crash that we just did, what they do? They printed money like mad, so we wouldn't go into Great Depression. And what did we do? We crucified the Fed. 
So we crucify the Fed for causing it, for not acting back in 29, and now we're crucifying them again in 2008 for doing what they should have done back in 29. That's the most important take home message. We don't want to repeat the Great Depressions, and, and destroying the Fed would create another depressionary scenario because the Fed needs to act in those scenarios. Here's the other one. This is the one that gets me. You know, when I see this, like, I, uh, it, um, yeah. it makes me feel like people are not being 100% honest with what, the, what you're being told. This is a chart you always see about the Federal Reserve printing money. Everybody seen this chart before? This is the famous one. Everyone's going, the Federal Reserve's printing money like math, right? And you're supposed to get all worried, right? It goes from about 800 billion here to two trillion, right? And we printed all this money. And we're supposed to be in some kind of a disaster right now, right? But the key is, this is monetary base, okay? Nobody ever tells you the difference between monetary base and money supply. All right? And also, Joe just said that QE2, they're printing money, they're buying up all the debt. This is QE2 about right here. The money supply hasn't increased. The monetary base hasn't increased after QE2. And I hope someone asks, asks me later on, why isn't the money base, monetary base uh, increasing after QE2? Because we keep tell, we're being told that they're buying 80, 90% of the debt, but it's not showing up in the monetary base. But you can see here, they did actually print some money, a lot of money, right? But this is monetary base, okay? Now, they also, you know, sooner say you're putting all this money is bad. Well, this is back in about, whoops, this is back in 2008, okay? Um, it's about 600, okay? You know, somebody's got like a time or something here. Um, okay, it goes from six to 2000 in, in uh, basically 11 years. Okay? If we're on a gold standard, so it essentially went up by three, three times. Okay? In this period, the money supply increased by three times. Now we want to go on a gold standard, right? That's what I'm hearing. Well, here's the price of gold. Over the same time period, the money supply under the gold standard would have increased by six times if you're using the market price of gold. Right? So the Fed increases by three, and that's awful. Going by a gold standard, it would have gone up by six, and that's not awful. Okay, that's a lot worse than what the Fed's doing. And these are market prices, once again. Okay? Okay? But remember, remember how I showed you the base increased by two? It doubled. We went from 800 to 2 trillion. Okay? But remember the multi money multiplier was cut in half. Five okay? So if, ten minutes. So if I double something and then I multiply it by 0.5 or half, what do I get? I stay the same, right? Right? So I double the monetary base. I cut the multiplier in half, so the money supply stayed the same. That's what they never tell you. It's all smoke and mirrors. They point to the monetary base, but the monetary base is irrelevant. They can print as much money as they want, put it in a vault, and it doesn't do anything. Money causes inflation when people spend it, right? Okay, so as you can see, the money supply doesn't increase much at all, even after printing all that money. Now, you can look it up yourself, but it's called M1. It's not the monetary base, it's monetary stock, or M1, okay? In this scenario, what happens? You increase M to get to uh, keep it, you increase M, you increase Q, and that's what the Fed did to keep the economy going. All right, now they keep, they, keep, they keep saying, okay, all this Fed, this printing of the money. Well, the only way I know how to test something like that is if you tell me there's inflation, I go look at the CPI. That's how I would do it. Or I would look at the 10-year bond rate. Well, here's where we printed all the money, right? We doubled the money, this monetary base, right? Here's the CPI, it fell through the floor. We just printed money and we got deflation? Explain that one to me, right? That's my problem with so many things we're hearing. You're, you, you hear one thing and then you look at the data and it's totally opposite. Um, here's the um, price of crude oil, okay? This is back in 2008. We printed all this money, crude oil fell through the floor. I'm not making those numbers up. Just pick up a Wall Street Journal. We printed money and the price of crude fell through the floor. There's a hole in the theory. We can ignore it all we want, but those are the facts. Okay? Here's the, um, the dollar. I keep I'm, I, someone keeps telling me the dollar's being debased or the dollar's collapsing, whatever. Okay? Here it is. Once again, we printed, here's the chart of the dollar. We printed all this money here, lines up here. 
The dollar is stronger than when we started printing all this money. Once again, these aren't my numbers. Pick up a Wall Street Journal. These are just simply factual numbers that you cannot argue with. Um, here's, here's every commodity I could find. Okay? Here we have agricultural. We got natural gas. They're giving it away. We put it the money back here. Here's, the, here's where it is now. They're giving natural gas away. Um, you know, you got livestock. You got every single commodity you can find out there is below where they started printing the money. Now, the prices are going up again, but that's after dropping substantially. All right? Now, here's the one that I think is the biggest flaw. I keep hearing all this stuff about the Federal Reserve caused the bubble in the, in the mortgage market. That's what I'm told. Joe, Joe will tell you the Fed, by lowering interest rates, causes this, this um, um, what's the term, the uh, malinvestment, right? The Fed, by you, lowering the interest rate, causes malinvestment, right? That implies that the Fed controls interest rates. Well, once again, when someone says something like that to me, I don't just take them at the word, I go and look at the market rates. Well, here's the, Q, here's the Jackson Hole speech about QE2. Here's where they implemented it. The rates are higher, higher than when they started printing money. Rates have gone up. The Fed states that they want to lower rates. They print the money and it goes higher. The Fed does not control long-term rates. The Fed does not control your mortgage. The, the Fed does not control your malinvestments. The markets do, right? The other thing is, the entire theory that they have is, a, is based on a flaw. This is this malinvestment idea. The Fed uh, creates what's called a, a price floor, right? The only thing a, 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 the Federal Reserve can do is choke off growth, okay? It can stop it. It can't stimulate more of it because once it lowers to a certain rate, the market rates take over. It's kind of like if they pass the law for McDonald's that they can't charge le uh, less than a do uh, two cents for a cheeseburger. <clears throat> Who cares? They're still going to charge a dollar for it, right? The Fed controls a price floor, so the very fundamental basis of the Austrian school is flawed with this basic economic concept. Um, here, once again, this is the CRB. You can see that the CR this is where the, the crash occurred. They printed all this money. The CRB, the Commodity Research Bureau, way below where it was. Um, here's, the, here's what I would call the real problem. We're focused on the Fed. If you want to focus on a real problem, focus on the debt. The debt isn't caused by the Federal Reserve. The debt is Congress spending money. Um, here is, now here's Joe. Joe showed you the, who owns the debt, right? Joe shows you here's who owns the debt. And he shows this part over. He forgets to tell you that who really owns the debt by a big way is you and me in our Social Security Trust Fund. Okay, U.S. citizens in our government bond funds, like he pointed out, Mr. Gross buys, dwarfs. This is the Federal Reserve. Now, the Federal Reserve, as he pointed out, holds about as much debt as China and Japan. Are you telling me we shouldn't have our Federal Reserve having as much debt as a single country does to manage our entire $14 trillion economy? That's not a whole heck of a lot. That's a fraction of the total debt. Matter of fact, if you look at the true fraction of it, they hold about $2 trillion. The unfunded liability of the U.S. is over $100 trillion. The Federal Five Reserve owns 2% of the debt. Five all right. Um, we've all heard this, this is a, you know, we've all heard about it, we've got to audit the Fed, right? Everybody's seen this Grayson video, right? And he just trashes that poor woman in Congress. Everyone seen this video? Yeah. You know, about the Federal Reserve, right? And he's, he's grilling her about questions. What is he grilling her about? Who remembers what he's grilling her about? What, what is her job? Her job is to audit the Fed, right? We're all passing this video around, but we didn't pay attention to what was her job. She's auditing the Fed, and he's grilling her on her lousy audit of the Fed. <clears throat> this is the other thing, you know, we keep saying we gotta end the Fed. First of all, if you're gonna say end the Fed, you better be able to say I'm gonna end the Fed and replace it with this, all right? Because ending the Fed would just simply be chaos. But let me guarantee you one thing, right now, the way I measure whether the Fed's doing a good job or not, it's what does the world see? The world has chosen us as the world's reserve currency. No, nobody forces them to use our dollar. They choose to use the dollar. And good old Hugh here is begging us to end the Fed. Because the moment we end the Fed, you want to know what becomes the world's reserve currency? The one, the renminbi. Okay? Right now, we're given a gift. It's the reserve currency. We keep playing around the Fed, and we lose that, then you're going to see some real costs go up. This idea about inflation benefiting the government, the government 
holds uh, bonds, they issue bonds. As the inflation rate goes higher, it costs the government more, not less. They're paying higher interest rates. I mean, it doesn't even make any sense. Um, the other thing is that the Fed is a, you know, I hear these things about the Fed is a privately owned bank. Right? Said here, is, here is the federal, uh, the Fed pays Treasury record $78 billion. The people who own the Federal Reserve are us, right? When they make a profit, it goes back to the Treasury. That's just the way it's set up. Um, you know, we talked about TARP. The other thing about TARP is, you know, there's a big headline that there's going to be a $700 billion bailout. That's right, it was going to cost the $700 billion. Did anyone follow this up? I went on Dirk's show two years ago and said, don't listen to any of that nonsense. We're going to make money on this deal. Right? We're not bailing anybody out. The Fed doesn't bail people out. They make loans. And lo and behold, gas poor, the government is making money on TARP. It's not going to cost us $700 trillion. We're going to end up making There money. are some legitimate parts about it, like government loans. There's a lot of bad things they did with TARP, but it's not the part that the Federal Reserve did. Um, you know, Joe's pointing to higher food, food prices. I challenge you to grab any article on higher food prices. You know what they're going to tell you? Drought and increase in demand is causing the higher food prices. The Fed doesn't cause drought. The Fed doesn't cause growth in, in China and India. Okay? No matter what you do, you're going to have inflation in the agriculture businesses because you've got more people buying food and you've got a drought shrinking the supply. But once again, don't take my word for it. You'll never read an article that says, Federal Reserve driving up food prices. Fed doesn't buy food. Okay, same thing with um, oil. Why is oil going higher? Just because we're bombing the, you know what, out of the Middle East. We're scaring the heck out of the markets, right? That has nothing to do with the Federal Reserve. They don't control OPEC. They don't control what's going on in Libya. Those prices are going to go higher whether we like them or not. It's not due to the monetary policies. Um, you know, Joe will tell you deflation is a good thing, but deflation is awful. Ask any farmer if deflation is good, right? Beginning of, the, beginning of the harvest season, they go out and they buy seed for $100. They go out and they plant it. End of the season, they get to sell it for $50. Is that good? No, you're bankrupt, right? But you'll be told that deflation is a good deal. Um, you know, when we're talking about the, uh, the idea of a gold standard, this is how you measure a gold standard. Under a gold standard, your monetary uh, supply is fixed. Joe points out the golden era of the, the, the gold standard. Well, it had to do a little bit with the 1949 gold rush and the discovery of gold in South Africa. Okay, but once that gold runs out, your economy runs out, right? Because you have to keep this money supply growing to keep your economy growing. Okay, if you take a look under a gold standard, if you take, you want, if you want to see what the real people who really lived under a gold standard, just do a Google search: William Jennings Bryan cross of gold. Right? Go look at what William Jennings Bryan said. He was all upset about the gold standard because it killed all the farmers. And why? Because at the beginning of the season, when things are in short supply, because you can't print any more money, the price goes higher, right? And then the, and the, and the quantity goes lower because there's less to buy. So this is the beginning of the season. You're, pay, you're buying high. At the end of the season, what happens? You dump your corn on the market, the price shoots to the roof, the price of your corn falls to the floor, your farmers are bankrupt. You want to wrap up? Yeah. Um, so this is your gold standard. It kills the agricultural industry. Um, they'll tell you the Fed causes bubble. Here's the tulip bubble. It was back in 1637, way before the Fed. Um, the first banking crisis was way back in 1833. The Fed doesn't cause these things. Um, you know, here's the, the, the this is a catch way too. Once again, we blame the Fed for the Great Depression for not acting. Now when they do act, we damn them again. Once again, we put them in a catch 22. And the last thing is this, this claim about the dollar losing value of 95% of its value. How many people have heard that? Right, the dollar's lost 95%. I challenge anyone to take that claim to a finance professor and ask him about that. And he's gonna say that's ridiculous. At best, it is a, it is a half truth. And what really bothers me is this seems to be like the foundation of the Austrian School of Economics, right? The only way that even holds comes close to being true if I earned a dollar back in 1913, yeah. put it in a jar, buried it, and got it at, and opened it 100 years later, in reality, you put that coin, you put that dollar in a bank that earns interest. And so in reality, real quick, I went and did the numbers, okay? Since 1913, a dollar would have to grow to $18 to compensate for the um, uh, inflation. 
If you just simply put in T-bills starting in 1930, you would have easily covered 18. In reality, if you would have taken that $1 in 1913, put it in the bank, it'd probably worth be about $200 today. So in the real world, that's a myth that they're talking about <coughs> as far as losing dollars. Okay. That's what well, I mean. If you want to ask a question, I have a rebuttal. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mike Tommaso. I uh, am here on behalf of Robert Owens, who was scheduled to be here. Uh, he's an attorney with uh, uh, up to his gills and alligators, and uh, he asked me to come on his behalf tonight. So uh, uh, hopefully I'll be an adequate substitute. But uh, let me introduce myself quickly. Um, Again, I'm Mike Tommaso. I'm from the same neck of the woods up in Delaware, Ohio. And uh, uh, I'll start off by telling you that uh, my background and, and interest in these matters is that I've been a member of the John Birch Society for almost 30 years uh, and a volunteer leader for most of that. And I was honored to be on the staff, the national staff of the John Birch Society as a field representative for Ohio, Michigan, and Western Pennsylvania for seven of those years. Uh, I also, so, and, and, I continue, and I remain a volunteer leader of the John Burr Society in Central Ohio. Uh, so I want to really kind of represent their position on this, that what we know to be the truth of these things, uh, but also my own personal ministry at, at uh, Liberty Heritage Center uh, which is my own personal ministry up in Delaware, Ohio. Uh, for your own reference, I'd like to just uh, steer you to the John Birch Society website at gbs.org. And my own website is at uh, libertyheritage.com. And uh, when, we, when we break up, I have business cards down here with uh, my name, phone number, contact information, and my website. Uh, now, uh, the first, it sounds like I'm, I'm going off here, but it, it's important for me to uh, uh, really kind of step back and give you a bigger picture and establish the foundations uh, and define terms. Uh, it's like the Hatfields and McCoys have been fighting for a hundred years and nobody even knows what it's about anymore. All I know is he did that and you did this and you know, and the foundations and the principles are long gone. We don't even know what it's about anymore, okay? I want to step back and go to the fundamentals, to the foundations, okay? Um, and the first fu fundamental foundation is that there is a rule book in all these things, okay? And it was the rule book of our founding fathers who established our constitution, a limited government of a morally self-government, faithful, morally self-governing free people, okay? Uh, and that was a strictly limited constitutional government, the principles of which come from this rule book, okay? From, from the scripture of the, of the living God, okay? There are also rules in here for economics, okay? This is the economics rule book. It's the moral rule book. It's the social rule book. So we can go a lot of places in this discussion. The Federal Reserve and economic matters we're going to come down to, okay? But I need to just start that there is a rule book that defines these things. If it's only human philosophy, okay, then don't tell me what problem you have with this school or that school. Because if it works for me, then your philosophy is no better than anybody else's, okay? There is a bedrock foundation. We speak of building our house. If you, if you build it on the weak and shifting sand of human philosophy, you might build a great house, but great will be its fall, okay? When you build it on a solid rock of the living God, that's the house that will stand, okay? So, uh, so one important uh, issue of all of this is one essential issue that is missing from this discussion, and that is that there's such a thing as right and wrong. There's such a thing as good and evil. That's right. Okay? There's good and there's evil. And so, this is the rule book of the living God, the creator God, and this by his providential hand, 
is the document that our founding fathers established for the governance of a free people, okay? A strictly limited government of a free people. So, let's talk about uh, the hard money. Let's start with hard money uh, that the whole world understood before, well before the foundation of the American Republic, long before 1870, okay? As a matter of fact, uh, if you refer to money in scripture, anywhere in scripture, it always translates gold and silver, okay? If you look at every civilization of history, the cradles of civilization of the Americas, the subcontinent, East Asia, Mediterranean Basin, before Marco Polo, before the Vikings, before Christopher Columbus, these cradles before they were known to each other. It was always gold and silver. Why is, why gold and silver? Okay? Why gold and silver? And some will argue, well, you know, because it's valuable and it's malleable and it's divisible and it has intrinsic value and so on, and these are all true, but if you look at the periodic table of the elements, that can be said of a lot of things. Why gold and silver? Well, my own assertion to you is that we cannot explain that in human terms. Human beings have instinctively understood that throughout civilizations of man, okay? Whether they know why or not. But gold and silver has been the basis of every civilized economy since the, bef before the written history of man well into the 20th century. So what happened in the 20th century? Well, let's talk about that. Because if there's a good and an evil, okay, that means that there's a God who presides over the destinies of nations, as Patrick Henry put it. And then, and I'm going to make a case, that when we fail to be morally self-governing, okay, when we fail... Uh, to act as free people, we will have the tyranny we demand. And that sovereign God will allow corruption to come in. And so that's the spiritual fight before us. This is not a temporal fight. It's not a fight of fluff and Hatfields and Accords. It's a spiritual warfare we're into. Okay? So if there's a good providential God who gives us the rule book, there's also evil. Okay? So, what happened there? Well, uh, I, I don't have time to give you all of this discussion, but... You have five um, minutes, Mike. How much? Five minutes. Okay. Uh, so, we uh, uh, have this... I, I'm, I'm, I'm not one to take the big sea bat, you know, that highly ridiculed sea bat with conspiracy on it, and bat people with it, but if what we're dealing with is evil, okay, and it comes from people who meet in the shadowy, smoky rooms at Jekyll Island, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about uh, a uh, science fiction movie here, okay? Uh, this is a real life place where representatives, not of the people, not of the government, but of the multinational bankers who for generations prior have been usurping governments and economies around the world for the purpose of establishing their new world order. Amen. Okay? And it was J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, the Rothschilds, these multinational bankers. What we're talking about is not philosophy. We're not talking about one school of economics against another. What we're talking about is criminals. Amen. We're talking, what we're talking about is criminal. The, the, the creature from Jekyll Island was done in great secret. And what they created, and I've got to make this long story short, what they created was a private monopoly. The Fed is not a government agency. 
It's a private monopoly of these multinational bankers, including the Rothschilds, and some of them are not even Americans, okay? And yet, out of the reach of our elected officials, okay, out of the oversight of the American electorate, these people dictate American policy. And if this is a criminal, if this is somebody uh, evil whose purpose is to usurp the place of the living God, okay, what does he have to do? Let's go back to why gold and silver. I'm going to tell you why gold and silver. Because gold and silver is no more, no less. I don't want to overstate it or understate it, but I'm going to make the assertion in the case that gold and silver is God's provision for an incorruptible standard among corruptible men. You don't need anybody to manage that. In God we trust. Everybody else pays gold and silver. And if it's not gold and silver, it's not money. That's right. Okay? So what else does the criminal do? The only thing that keeps the criminal credible and in power is deception and lie. Because his father, the devil, is a liar and the father of lies. And it's built on the house of lies. And, and the lie that Federal Reserve toilet paper, s and green stamps, okay, has any value is only based on the lie that nothing is worth something. That deception is the only thing that keeps that bubble floating. Okay? Now I'm going to shift gears real fast. Um, I can introduce you to Edward Mandel House, who was a representative of J.P. Morgan, who raised the Jekyll Island meeting. He was the, uh, 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 he's been called the guardian angel of the Federal Reserve. Okay? He was Woodrow Wilson's man talking in his ear for eight long years. Uh, when the United States refused to join the League of Nations after World War I, which world government is the ultimate purpose of all of this, okay? All right? They had to go back to the drawing board because the United States refused to join the League of Nations. So they had to go back to the drawing board. They were greatly set back by this, okay? Edward Mandel House founded the Council on Foreign Relations in New York City in 1921 for the purpose of creating uh, a world government and uh, selling the notion of surrendering American sovereignty piecemeal to this world government. So this was a track that Edward Mandel House wrote in 1911. Okay? It's not me talking. Read it from his very words. And one very telling lie or statement in there is that what he's working for is, Mark, as, is uh, socialism as dreamed of by Karl Marx. That's what he's working for. Okay? What he established is the Council on Foreign Relations in New York City, incorporated in 1921. These people have been the concealed enemies of God and country working to create world government and draw the United States into it for 90 years, okay? Shadows of Power by James Perloff. I can't give you that presentation. To wrap up. Okay, I can't give you that now. Uh, Shadows of Power by James Perloff, highly recommended, okay? Uh, Dr. Anthony Sutton uh, spoke of Wall Street. He did, he was, he's a, a very important researcher. Uh, who, who uh, did much research on the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, they are Wall Street. They are the American media. That's it's right. not a liberal media. That's right. It's an insider CFR media. Okay? You got, if we don't understand that, we don't understand why the lie and the deception and what they're really about. Anthony Sutton is just a brilliant guy, and he wrote a series of books I can't even tell you about. Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution. What these Wall Street bankers are the creators of international communism. They are the creators of the United Nations. They are the creators of every usurpation of our Constitution, our God-given liberties, and they will destroy our country. Now what you're seeing right now is the destruction of the American middle class. That has been their target, okay? 
Now, inflation, I want to go to inflation very quickly, okay? What is inflation? See, we can talk about it, but can we define it? Well, let, let me put it to you this way. When you take a basketball and you blow it up, what are you doing to it? You're increasing the volume of it. Right? So, when you hold up a basketball, you say, well, this is, this is a bunch of uh, air molecules that are worth less? Is that what it is? No. What you're doing is increasing the volume of it. And as a result, the equal parts become worth less, okay? I've got a money uh, a, a set up down here. Anybody take a look at it. It's not for the take, okay? <laughs> I do have two handouts over here, one about the monetary mayhem and one about the Council on Foreign Relations. They are free for the take, please feel free. The two on that end. Thanks, Mike, uh, appreciate it. Do other governments in our world To understand the width and depth and breadth of these people and their tentacles all over the world for over 200 years, you got to understand that just like Lenin put it, okay, first fall the masses of Asia and then Europe and then, you know, they surround the United States who will, they intend to fall into their hands like overripe fruit, okay? So they've already been to work generations prior to any real success in the United States. We are the last and best prize. So, so the gold standard gold is long standard. gone. Oh. I'm sorry, okay. go ahead. So gold, they do not go by the gold standard, is what you're saying? Nobody does anymore, no. And I mean, the inside still do have. to some extent? No, no. Yeah. not at all. It's absolutely backed by nothing. And it's private people behind the scenes out of anyone's uh, oversight, they've never been audited, never been accountable to anybody, who determined that they're going to write a check for one and a half trillion dollars inflating the money supply. So where is the gold that we used to do? That's a good question. Was in our, in our banks, banking, backing up our, our dollars. I think you'd have a tough time forcing your way into the vaults at Fort Knox just to find out that they're guarding an empty hole in the ground. So that's a very good question. Where did it go? Are they, did they, they did not inform me when they took it out. Like King yeah. Hezekiah. You're <laughs> <laughs> familiar with that story, I'm sure. Can the audience ask questions? Ask well, I can answer question. your question. Where the gold went? There's 30 tons of that gold currently sitting in, the, in a bank vault in Switzerland. <laughs> okay. You can see. Okay. Man, I've got a question of uh, Robert. It seems like. Uh, doesn't jive with what uh, Joe said. Um, you said that you print money to bring the equation back into balance. Yes. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, the fact that uh, the Fed did nothing in 1920, how does that jive with what you just said? The, the main, well, that's the problem. We had a banking collapse during the Great Depression. I'm saying the Depression you referred to in 1920. Okay, 1920 was not, that's a good, that's a real good question. 1920 was not a banking cr uh, crisis collapse. That was a, people were coming home from World War II and it was a demand driven sh uh, shock. You know, the war ended, so the economy slowed down. Uh, the economy, by the way, the GDP, when he says that it did nothing, it just, we just went back to normal, uh, it went, the economy dropped by 20%. I mean, when we have, when there was, there was, the Fed did nothing, and we recovered in 18 months, is yes, what he said. Because of so if we can recover in 18 months after a big uh, problem like that in 1920, why did we have to? Why did we have to do what you just said here uh, by inflating the money or uh, pumping up the money supply? Uh, we, we don't, like I said, we don't, we don't have to. There's different types of recessions and depressions. Joe is describing a kind of like an inventory recession. Okay, there's a natural business cycle that has its ups and downs. You can weather those. The economy cannot weather a banking collapse. The way I describe the monetary system is the monetary system is like the operating system of a computer. You know, we can sit there and we can allow GM to go bankrupt. We can allow Enron to go bankrupt. We can allow all these little private companies to go bankrupt. If you let the banking system collapse, it kills the entire economy. 
It prevents the farmers from getting loans. It prevents the automakers from getting loans. It, can, it prevents the consumer from getting loans. It shuts everything down. So it's literally like a computer crashing, or the, the banking system is like the heart of an individual. Once you lose the heart, you lose everything. You gotta remember, money isn't consumed. You don't buy money and eat it. You know, you, money does nothing more than train, it's like the grease of an engine. So if you let that grease go out of an engine, the engine seizes up. So in his situation, there's just simply a normal demand-driven uh, slowdown. Yeah, getting back to your question then about uh, the interest rates went higher because uh, you know, we said we printed all this money and yet interest rates went higher. That's what you said. No, uh, QE2, when they came out, they said QE2, the stated purpose of QE2 was to lower interest rates. They wanted to drive the 10-year bond lower. That was the stated objective. The Fed said, we are going to lower interest rates. The market said, no, you're not, and they sent them higher. The point with that is, people are telling you that the Fed caused the mortgage crisis. The Fed does not control the market rates okay, of the well, long range curve. Higher, wouldn't that mean that borrowers are saying, we want more of these dollars for uh, as interest because uh, you're paying us back with dollars that are worth less? That, that could be, but okay, the, the second is, thing then is what caused interest rates to go up in, in 1980 when the prime rate went to like 20%? Uh, in, in 1980, there's a, there's a, there's a multiple, well, that, that's a great example. The Federal Reserve puts a price floor in the market. The Federal Reserve can increase interest rates. That's what they did in the 80s. That's, the whole, that's, my, that's my whole point about the Austrian school. They put a floor, they can tell you that you can't go below something but they can't tell you you can't go above something. That's why the, the longer end of the curve, you know you have a curve that goes from overnight loans to the 30-year mortgages. They, the Fed doesn't control this area out here. They control the shortest of the short loans, the overnight loans. Uh, and so when they're talking about malinvestment and stuff, those are market rates. So the entire foundation of the Austrian school is basically saying the markets don't know how to be markets. And I just totally disagree with that. The markets know how to set the rates. I buy that. If you, you said that the problem with the U.S., right now is tremendous government debt. Didn't you say that? Okay, if that's the problem, why would you want to have an institution that, in, that enables the government to borrow even more? The, the Fed does not do that. Huh? The, Fed, the Fed is, before this crisis, the Fed owned $800 billion. That's a fraction of the debt. You okay. gotta remember, well, if they couldn't own any, would we have as much U.S. debt? Sure, I mean, the Chinese, the Chinese buy as much debt as the Fed. You and your Social Security Trust Fund you know, we, we funded the war with, with uh, uh, war bonds. The, you got to remember the Treasury raises money by either raising ta taxes or issuing bonds. They can get the money any way they want. They don't rely on the Fed. The Fed just simply has that money there so that they can manage the monetary system. Okay, one final question. I agree with you that if you tried to abolish the Fed overnight, you know, chaos. And we've created this juggernaut which Perhaps it's kind of like the machine that just goes on and on and it perhaps cannot be unassembled. However, would you agree with, uh, uh, you know, the, we have all kinds of markets uh, that create standards. You know, we have, we've created standards in computers, we've created standards in video recording and so on. Why wouldn't the market create its own standards for money based on the money which proved to function as a commonly accepted medium of exchange? and one which obstructed government's propensity to meddle with the currency system. Okay, well, first of all, we do have competing currencies. Uh, you can go buy yen if you want, you can go buy gold if you want, you can buy those things. The important thing is that when the world looked for a currency, they chose the dollar. The entire world, when it looked for a competing currency, it chose our dollar. Now there's ways that, you know, I'm not, I mean, I can list multiple ways to improve the Fed. Um, you know, when we're talking about the reason the gold standard worked is because during a time period of work, the gold supply grew at the rate of the economy. Rate of the economy. We kept discovering new gold. There's nothing stopping the, you know, the Congress from passing a bill that says, look, a computer should run the Fed. It should increase the money supply at this rate, you know, and adjust for so and so. So there's ways to improve the Fed. Um, but my point is that you know, people are criticizing the Fed from 1930 on, 1913 till today. During that time period, we became the greatest economy this world has ever known. I mean, we are the world's economic superpower. We are a $14 trillion economy. No country even comes close to us, and we're only 300 we're million people. We're a nation, but we do not have money. Okay, we're broke. Next. Okay, oh, there's a gentleman in the back that has his hand up for a long time, sir. Yeah, my Thank name you. is Fred.
Fred Bender, and I'm with the John Bird Society. And I would like to know how in the heck you can say what you're saying up there. The Fed counterfeits money. It makes it up out of thin air. Is that allowed in this state? Does your granddaughter, can, do, can she do that? And the Fed has been controlled by the Council of Foreign Relations from 1929 up and even before that, clear up to Greenspan by the Council of Foreign Relations. And I would like to have Mike Tommaso, uh, Joe, and you guys talk about this. Tell me more about what this Fed is about. And it's, if I can't counterfeit money, then the Federal Reserve can. Our Constitution would not allow that. Hey, Mike. Well, if I may, and I, that's really where I was kind of trying to go with this. Uh, <clears throat> um, when we talk about inflation and such, gold and silver, you can't create it, you can't destroy it, you can't manipulate it. It has a constant. You don't have to have more of it, except maybe only in proportion to population. You know, and throughout history, as as populations have grown, so has the supply, and it's remained relatively constant and very stable. Okay. And I think that, that gentleman's question has maybe a lot to do with not necessarily inflation, but our debt. Uh, no, it's no, he's talking about printing money, and I want to. That's where I'm going. Wagner says, "Inflate, inflate, inflate." I right. mentioned uh, how the practice of clipping coins, where a coin that was weighed so much gold, so much silver, you could clip it and nobody would notice it, you pass it on. After a while, you got a pile of gold there, okay? And you're actually devaluing that thing doing there. Criminals throughout history have schemed such things as that. You know, alchemists of history have tried to create gold and they can't do it, okay? I mean, they can't do it. I mean, they can't get around the system. The liar and the usurper. Okay, has thrown out this God-provided standard. They threw out a God-provided standard. I don't know any other way of putting that. To a standard that they control, they can create, they can destroy as they please. And therefore, if they want to write a check, and, and Joe mentioned the inflation tax, and I want to talk about that, because if they don't have the revenues to cover the debt that they can never, ever have enough money for. These people can never have enough money for this debt, okay? They got to write the check for it, okay? That itself is theft. When they write a check for one and a half trillion dollars that doesn't exist, that means they just created one and a half trillion dollars. Now, either there's something wrong with that, or I'm in the wrong business. The debt is due to treasury bonds. The, tr the Congress borrows money and spends the money. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is a bank. It makes loans. $800 billion prior to the crisis, yes, $800 billion was loaned to the federal government. Here's the debt. Okay, you're talking uh, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid thrown in with the current funded debt is $112 trillion. The Fed debt owns what, $2 trillion of that? Less than 2% of that? The Federal Reserve has nothing to do with that debt. What that has to do with is an incredibly irresponsible Congress. And this is what gets me about this issue. We should be directing our effort to where the problem is. The problem is an out of control government, not Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve just simply bailed it, prevented a banking crisis. They made loans, those loans are getting paid back. They're not just printing money out of loan every uh, next printing it and buying things. They make a loan. The economy, they, the, the company, it's kind of like a bank, it's like a farmer. They made a loan to you at the beginning of the planting season. You planted your corn, you now have harvested, harvested the corn, you sold it, you're now paying back your loan. That's all the Federal Reserve does. 
They don't need to be crucified over that. That is what we should be crucifying people over, and that's an irresponsible Congress. The, the, federal, the, the Fed has given the Congress an unlimited credit card that's through the printing press. So I have a hard time believing that you cannot divorce the two. And just, it's like giving a credit card to your teenager and just saying, oh, you know, I don't understand why you, uh, you know, just bought a Ferrari. Well, see, the reason I introduced the big picture of the Council on Foreign Relations as well is because uh, there's truth to what Bob's saying here is that they're not solely responsible, but the people who control uh, the Fed, who are in control of the Fed, uh, also control the executive, the legislature, the legislative, the judicial, and they work hand in hand, okay? Uh, the same way they, they can never bring in enough money, they can never spend enough money, and, and there's always going to be a crisis with these people. I think part of the problem is in here is you're using terms that are not mixable. He refers as Federal Reserve notes as money, and you're refu referring the gold and silver as money, okay? Federal Reserve notes are not money. If you look up the legal definition of the term money in the dictionary, it specifically says that notes are not involved in money. Money is gold and silver. The Federal Reserve prints instruments of debt or evidences of debt and then loans it into circulation. If you get the modern money mechanics, that's a, 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 a volume from the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, and you read it, and there are several other uh, books that are out by the Federal Reserve which are no longer in print, so you have to dig to find them. It defines in there how the Federal Reserve works, and the Federal Reserve <clears throat> does not print money. Money is gold and silver coin, always has been and always will be. So we don't have an economy that's based on the value of money. We have an economy that's based on the value of debt that's loaned into circulation by the Federal Reserve, and there is a debt that's created by that. It's trillions of dollars that we owe the Federal Reserve because we've never paid for the interest on the loan of the debt into the circulation. Okay, so you have to look at the terms that are being utilized and passed around and commingled in here until you understand that Federal Reserve notes aren't money, never have been and never will be, and that Fed and silver and gold coin are money, and you can't mix the two. They're like water and oil, okay? Until you understand that, put that in your brain, you can't understand what's going on here. He said you hope somebody would ask you a question about the monetary base and why it's not the same yeah. as M1 or M1. Well, I, I, kind of, I kind of covered that. When they're talking about printing money, there's a monetary base, which is the actual physical dollars. Okay? We work in a fractional reserve system. That means if I take $1 and put it in a bank, it becomes $10 in the economy. I take that dollar, I put it in the bank, the bank loans it, that person puts it in loan, and it gets multiplied throughout this, the economy. That's why when you pull $1 out of an economy, it's like pulling $10 out of the economy. So $1 out of the bank shrinks the money supply by more than $1. So matter of fact, that's what got me into economics. The first week that you, you, you know, I, I, first lesson you learn in macroeconomics is the banking system. And that's what got me turned on to economics was I could see in the Great Depression, those people panicking, pulling that dollar out, not realizing that they're pulling $10 out of the economy. And they were, that panic created its own mess. And that's why I have this conference, this is why we're having this presentation, is because I don't want our economy to repeat that mistake. I don't want to weaken the banking system so we have to go through another banking system. Um, one other thing about the counterfeit money, not, not money. this is what, what you call a um, continental. We've had, we've had paper dollars since the beginning of our time. Um, Article 1, Section 8 gives the power to Congress to coin money and regulate the value thereof. So people, when people are saying, you know, the, the things are so stable under a gold standard, it's because the government got to stamp a value on gold. If they wanted to print money, they would revalue that gold. Every problem you're identifying with the fractional reserve system, the Federal Reserve, you have with the gold standard and a lot more. Um, as far as the central bank history, you know, they're saying that the central bank's unconstitutional. Well, the first central bank was created under Washington. It existed through Adams and Jefferson. It was stopped. The charter ran out under Madison. 
the guy who wrote the Constitution, and you want to know what he did? He turned around and created the second central bank. So if it's unconstitutional, if it's counterfeit, our founding fathers didn't know that. A couple of comments. First of all, what you're calling the monetary base is what I, I think it's the same as what used to be ter termed high-powered money in the currency and circulation. Currency. It's the actual physical dollars and currencies. Yeah, and the other thing is, uh, it, it is high-powered money because it gets multiplied once it gets in bank. I mean, if the Federal Reserve is just a central bank, isn't it? Yeah, it's a bank. So what I'm concerned about is, uh, you know, this idea of associating uh, the Federal Reserve with all kinds of mysterious and evil people. Uh, well, how come nobody's saying that about the first, second, and third central bank in the, in the 19th century? If you go back and you read about the, the creation of the first central bank, you will see what the criticisms were back then, where foreign central bankers were going to buy it and own it. Unfortunately, foreign central bankers did partially own it. We were a young nation and we needed reserves. However, the important thing is control of the monetary policy. The foreign central bankers were prevented from it. Now, if you go to today, you know, we hear a lot about um, the creature from Jekyll Island, okay? The creature from Jekyll Island, when they created the, the, the bank in 1913, if you read the creature from Jekyll Island, you'll hear all these stories about foreign central bankers and, and um, uh, J.P. Morgan and things like that. They wrote a bill at Creature from Jekyll Island. The problem no one ever tells you, that bill never passed. Every one of the concerns that you'll hear about central bankers and things never made it in the final bill. It's called the Aldrich Plan. Look it up. The Aldrich Plan never passed. So they wrote a bill that never passed. It didn't do anything. It just renamed it. I, I appreciate what uh, what this panel is trying to do is bring truth no, to the not. forefront. Okay. And uh, and uh, I, I really agree with your position, Mike. I I, I, I believe that position wholeheartedly. And Joe, I really like your presentation. I like to have a copy of it, uh, Bob. Uh, in, in your presentation, the, the problem with it is there's a lot of half truths there. You're not you're not bringing forth all of the information where a person can understand fully what the problems are. You mentioned that the Fed is uh, owned by the people of America. It is not. It's owned outright by private banks who are all involved with the with the 12 uh, federal districts. They own the Federal Reserve. The only part of the Federal Reserve that uh, uh, is controlled at all by uh, our government is the uh, Board of Governors and the uh, other board that's in there. They regulate and work together with the Federal Reserve, but the Federal Reserve is owned privately. If you, if you take a look on the meetup that I sent out, okay, one of the very first links describes what he just explained. Okay, now this is the problem. The, there, yes, Private banks do, quote unquote, own the Federal Reserve. But it's not ownership like you own a private corporation. It's like the Social Security Trust Fund. It's basically an accounting entry. The, the member banks, in order to be part of the Federal Reserve, you basically own shares in the Federal Let's Reserve. Say, let's call it preferred stock. It's exactly okay. preferred stock. Now, what that means is you don't have any voting control. It just simply means you're going to be paid a fixed dividend, essentially to compensate you for the reserves that you hold on account at the bank. It's nothing like ownership of a private corporation. The, the, Fed, the, the, the president nominates the people, and he's absolutely right. You've got a board of governors that are nominated by the government to represent the people. It's owned by the people. The profits from the central bank go back to the treasury. It's just simply a fact. Miami versus PQ equation. I don't have any problems with that except your analysis of it doesn't really go into the reaction, uh, reactionary analysis as far as, uh, you know, cause and effect. And uh, <clears throat> the, the problem that, one of the biggest problems I have with the Federal Reserve, uh, besides, uh, uh, you know, the history of the decline of America over the last hundred years, okay, um, is it's, it's, it's government privatization, okay, which where we hear, you know, Governor Kasich today wanting to privatize all these governmental agencies and so forth, which I feel is bad. You know, we put government in place to handle certain matters. It's not up to government to turn around and privatize that in, into the uh, private markets, okay? Uh, government has the authority to control our monetary system. 
And when they do that, they maintain that piece of our national sovereignty, okay? When, when they delegate that out, they lose control over that in some regards, and I have a problem with that. I think our government is fully capable of operating our monetary system without having to turn it over to private. Well, government. they are. Our, our government does control the monetary system. Yeah. Our, our, the, the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 was a creation of Congress. The Congress nominates the people, the President of the Congress nominates, they totally control it. They wrote the charter of the Federal Reserve. They tell the Federal Reserve how to implement their monetary policy. Um, everything the Federal Reserve does has been, we can pass laws to tell the Federal Reserve to do anything that, you know, if, they, if you want to have a computer replacement, they can. We, we've given them a dual mandate by Congress for low employment and low inflation. We wrote that as we the people. We, you know, if you ever watch the news, you'll see Ben Bernanke testifies in front of Congress, so they measure, how are you doing? We the people control the Federal Reserve. Uh, yeah. He made a comment that, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve gets audited. The amount of auditing that goes on with the Federal Reserve is very minimal. Um, uh, when Ron Paul introduced the bill to audit the Fed, he was wanted to do a more in-depth audit to be able to track where uh, those monies are transferred through the Fed as opposed to just looking at its balance. I'm very glad you asked that question. Very glad. Okay, because this gets at the root of everything. The worst thing you could ever do is politicize the Federal Reserve. Okay? You never want the Congress to be able to say, print me money because I need to go spend it to do this event. We can all agree. If you want to see a politicized Federal Reserve, look at Zimbabwe. Now, getting back to Fed, Ron Paul, what Ron Paul wants to do, we audit the Fed, we audit their books. Be very careful and listen to what Ron Paul wants to audit. He wants to audit the monetary policy decision making. That's politicization of the Fed. That means Barney Frank can go in there and lean on Ben Bernanke and say, Ben, you should have been given more money here. Right now, our Federal Reserve acts like a republic. It has a little constitution. It has a constitution that, that has low employment and low inflation, and they have certain variables that they have to track to make sure that they maintain that. The moment you get that out of there and you say, okay, from now on, we're going to let the Congress control it. Now, we've had a bank controlled by Congress. It's called Fannie and Freddie. And we know how that turned out, because once you politicize the banking system, which is what they did with Fannie and Freddie, you can see the absolute nightmares. These people start controlling the money supply. That's dangerous. You know, I'm all about the Constitution. I think the biggest problems that we have today is a direct result of government not adhering to the Constitution for the past hundred years. Uh, the only other comment I have in regards to the monetary system, I mean, to me, a fractional reserve banking system is absolutely ludicrous. You shouldn't be able to issue receipts for money that don't exist. That's right. Okay. I'm glad you may ask that question as well. What's the alternative to a fractional reserve system? A, a sound system it's based on substance. Yeah. That is that is limited. That allows the, the the economy to balance itself based on the supply of money available. Well, the Bank of Amsterdam operated as a 100 percent reserve bank. So exactly. we're in a problem. It's impossible to have a, it's impossible to have a 100 percent reserve bank. But it's happened throughout history, and they've been quite successful. So you do not need for no. Right now we're a zero reserve bank. Bob, uh, you 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 mentioned the. Uh, the CPI, and, and by that I interpret the official CPI. Well, the, the official CPI leaves out food and energy prices. I find that to be a very uh, <laughs> a flawed premise right there. Um, you, you cited uh, several times the Wall Street Journal as, as an authority of, and, and suggested it, that it was, that it was like the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the Wall Street Journal has many, many agendas. It is not uh, neutral journalism. Uh, very quickly on gold, I think one of the most cogent things I've ever read about gold was very recent. Uh, it's an article by Gary North. I'm sure that's a name that many people in here know. Uh, but the basic premise of uh, his article was that gold, contrary to what many people say, has no intrinsic value. But his conclusion said, my hope in holding gold is that someday someone will purchase it from me with something that I need more than the gold. Uh, good point. Uh, the CPI, or if you, if you keep going these long lists, I can't, I won't be able to remember everyone. 
Well, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm actually leading up to questions here. Those were, those were just kind of preliminary comments. And by the way, as far as conspiracy theory is concerned, I'll put in my two cents worth on that too. Um, you know, there's a difference between believing in conspiracies, obviously we know they exist, and on the other uh, end, believing that they are our all powerful, totally coordinated, run by competent people, and ultimately destined for success. Big difference between those two extremes. Uh, how do you, so to the question, how do you reconcile uh, the premise that the, your statement that the Fed should not be politicized with the idea, if you agree with this, that the Fed should be accountable? Uh, the Fed, well, the, the reason I'm, I'm a big Fed fan is because I, I work in this industry. And for the last, I mean, I, I've worked through the, the boom of the 90s, and I've worked, worked through the bust of the 2000s, and every time things would happen, I would sit there and say, if I was Ben Bernanke, what would I do? And I just know every time something happened, Ben did exactly what I would have done, is all I can say. And when we're talking about the Wall Street Journal, I am talking about quoted market rates. These things, the market, it, it, we're, we're, you can pick up the USA Today, you can pick up any newspaper you want. The market rates tell you what the entire collective mind of the market is doing. You can't corrupt, you can't have conspiracy theory to control the markets. This is the entire world buying our bonds, and they're telling you there's no inflation to fear. Now, I can sit there and I can listen to people tell me everything they want. I just simply look at the bond rates. The bond rates tell me there's no inflation to fear. And, and if, I, if I said something about conspiracy theories, the carols, or whatever, I apologize. I didn't think I said anything about conspiracy theories. But, but again, getting back, getting back to the question was, how do you, you know, again, the question, how do you reconcile the idea that the Fed should be non-politicized, in other words, above politics? Am I understanding you correctly? The Fed is unapolitical. All right, so, so you, you're, how do you reconcile the statement, your statement, that, that the Fed is and should be apolitical with the idea, which you may disagree with, that the Fed should be accountable to the people of the United States. The, okay, the Fed is accountable to a charter that we wrote. We, when you look at how they set the Federal Reserve up, they did it very well. They understood that you had to shield it from the will of the people just telling them to print money. You gave them two goals. You went out there, like right now if you look at the Euro, they have one goal, maintain price stability. They don't have an unemployment uh, mandate. We wrote a bill that said, look, What's the purpose? What do we want the Federal Reserve to do? We want to maintain stable prices and low unemployment. That's what we said. We don't want it to be politicized. We get, it's, like, it's like their constitution. We wrote a constitution. We gave it to the people of the Fed and said, you guys run it. It's, it's an instruction manual. They can't sit there and say, you know what? I really like Barack Obama. I'm going to go print money. They can't do that because the bond rates will tell you whether they're straying from that charter. The markets, the entire world market looks at us and says, are they doing a good job? The moment you politicize the Fed, those bond rates are going to go through the roof, so, and we're so, dead. So if I understand you correctly, and, and, and stop me if I'm wrong or, or amend it, if I'm, uh, the Fed in, in, not being, uh, in being above politics, this is, your, this is your ideal of the Fed, should also be above accountability. It's, it, is accountable to, it is accountable to their charter of low employment. They have a dual mandate. I'm talking about accountability to the citizenry of the United States of America. They, well, they, they are accountable to, they are, we told the Federal Reserve to do something. It's like, our, it's like our Constitution. We have a Supreme Court, and the Constitution interprets the law. We wrote a law for the Federal Reserve, and every year, Ben Bernanke gets in front of Congress, and we get to measure him whether he followed the law so or not. the Federal Reserve, in, in, in the scenario that you just painted here, and if you brought up the Supreme Court, so, so the Federal Reserve is the duly constituted fourth branch of government. No. It's, it answers the, it was created by Congress. It's a branch. It, okay. The Federal Reserve is the way the Congress has chosen to implement their power to coin and regulate the money. The U.S. dollar came to supremacy when we were on a gold standard, and the U.S. dollar was was okay. rock solid. It was the gold standard. And then, um, let's see, second of all, um, let's see, I have here the, this is a academics, this is an elementary, an elementary textbook on civil government. It's called The Shorter Course in Civil Government. It was written before the progress. The power of Congress to coin money is one of the ordinary prerogatives of sovereignty. It is exercised for the purpose of securing a proper circulation of genuine instead of base coin in commercial transactions. In order to ensure its purity and uniformity of value, 
The coining of money is placed exclusively under the supervision of federal government. Each money, each piece of money, coin, is stamped in such a manner as to indicate its precise value. You mentioned the earlier coin at the act that regulated the specific grains and stuff of the coins, and that it was metal, precious metals. And it, it no, nowhere in the, in, the, in the common understanding of, and this was the early 20th century, from the beginning of the constitutional government, which was post -continent, the continentals were, were inflated, nothings created before that, and out of the experience of that came the, article, the defined powers of Congress to coin money that was real. Okay. And so the question, the question is, um, based on the Constitution, um, how is the how is the a federal the Federal Reserve creating fiat money, a constitutional method of coining money when money money is gold or silver, and it was supposed to be coined and the common understanding, even a, even a couple hundred years years after the fact was that that power meant to actually coin money of value as opposed to backless paper. Okay, well, well first right. of all, first of all, you, you are right. When the dollar was originally uh, coined the, the reserve currency, um, you are right. Um, the how is that, that we, are on a gold, we are on a gold standard. However, there's nothing stopping the world from getting off the gold standard. They are fighting tooth and nail over in China to become the world currency. There's nothing stopping the world from saying goodbye dollar, hello, we're in NIMBY. Okay, so the, the, the fact stands that whether we were on a gold standard when we started or not, we have maintained the world's reserve status since we've been off the gold standard, which is 30 years now. Um, now, as far as the constitutionality of it, the, constitu the, the gold and silver part applies to the states, not the federal government. It clearly states, re it clearly states regulate the value thereof. Once they can regulate the value thereof, what difference does it make? They can sit there and change the value of a gold coin all they want, and they did. Back in the, in the matter of fact, in the Great Depression, FDR used to just do it on, on a random basis. FDR was un extra constitutional. His seizure of gold, okay. I mean, just like anything else. Goes the abolition of gold was one of his first acts as president. And, yes, and, and our, but bottom line is, I'm just saying. was created by the progressive era of Woodrow Wilson, and it ushered in the a possibility of a massive government. All, all I can say is this is where we are. Whether it's constitutionality or not, Let's go challenge it constitutionally. Um, if you want to go back in a gold standard, put it up, you know, let's go do it. My point is, right now, we just have to look at what system we have right now. It is a paper currency, just like they'd had in the Continentals, back when they had the first and central. I mean, I'm not gonna argue with George Washington. It was constitutional. Is there money pure? George Washington did not approve of it. And, and the Continentals were a flop, and nobody accepted them. Uh, so, I mean, I wouldn't make a comparison there. And that was before our Constitution. And the, the, the fluff and debates changed, but the Constitution has not changed. And what Michael's saying is right, uh, that it will be gold and silver, and if it's not gold and silver, it's not money. And when it says regulate the value thereof, there's only one way to regulate the value of money, and that is to define that unit as so much weight in gold, so much weight in silver. Gold and silver, have a world known, worldwide accepted purchasing power per unit. And if the dollar has any value at all, it's not by anybody's fiat decree, it is because it is so much weight in gold, so much weight in silver. And you can take that gold piece or that silver dollar, you can whack it with a hammer, and it's still a dollar anywhere in the world. The dollar used to be defined in law and it no longer is. I'm sorry, sir. The dollar used to be defined by law, but it no longer is. The dollar is no longer defined in law. Right. But even if you have a gold standard, let's say we go to the gold standard, the government gets to choose what that gold's worth. I mean, here's no, a chart. Here's no, a, no, they don't. They, they don't 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 when they say coin money, who's going to choose how it gets coined? The, per, the prevailing purchasing power of gold and silver around the world is what it is. Nobody can decree that. Well, That's a supply and demand market. Well, the dollar rides on the back of gold and silver, not the other way around. This is a, this is a very good point that people have to understand. Okay, when you take a gold standard, you take an ounce of gold or whatever amount, and you're going to stamp a value on it. That fixes it. It never moves again. That's why you have a, a, a nickel worth a nickel here, and 100 years later, it's worth a nickel. The problem is 
the price level swings all over the place to make sure that you can, you can buy different amounts of the dollar. This is the gold, this is the price of gold. It's gone from 200 to 1400 in a very short period of time. That's literally printing money if you don't stamp a value on it. If we we're under a gold standard, that would be a flat line. So all these people buying gold, they have as much money today as they did back in the you know, early eight, you know, 1980s. Your value of gold wouldn't change at all. No, there's a factor. Isn't that the objective, though, is to have a stable monetary That's what the Fed does, and that's why they have a price rule. They, they maintain a minimal amount of inflation. If I may, there's a factor here that needs to be discussed, and that is insider manipulations of the prices of gold and silver, okay? Particularly J.P. Morgan, who have held gold and silver down to a ridiculously undervalued number for a long time, and I don't know if it's an issue of relinquishing it or demand is just such that it's driving the numbers up right now, whether they like it or not. But gold and silver are grossly undervalued compared to these toilet paper dollars. And, uh, it is demand for those.